welcome to the Season 1 Reboot of Video Games in the World. I am John, your host, and you're asking yourselves, why have I decided to restart Video Games in the World? Because I want to make it better, with much more originality, and better content as well. Also, during the quarantine, I was inspired to start this to make it a lot better and do a lot more things that I couldn't do when I started Video Games in the World Season 1. So, this one will have more episodes, some of the same, but with better content and more extended and more educational. So, the first episode of Video Games in the World is about the birth of video games. When video games first rose and how they became mainstream entertainment, loved by many and scorned by others. To some, video games are just a hobby. To some, video games are only a waste of time. But to so many people, gaming is a way of life. Let us start the year 2021 with the very first episode of the Season 1 Reboot of Video Games in the World. Enjoy! What is a video game? A video game is an electronic game that involves user interaction to generate visual feedback on a video device such as a TV screen or a computer monitor. Video games are sometimes believed to be a form of art, while others have condemned it. In the beginning, there was a world without video games. Before video games, people found other forms of entertainment such as children playing hide and seek, tic-tac-toe on pencil and paper, tag, and people even went to the matinee as they called a the movie theater back in those days. However, the creation of video games began in the middle of the 20th century, when innovative minds at the MIT began to create video games. Before all of that though, in 1947, the earliest example was a cathode ray tube amusement device, which was filed for a patent on January 25 of that same year, by Thomas T. Goldsmith Jr. and Estelle Ray Mann, and issued on December 14 of 1948 as US Patent 245592. At first, they had machines where you got to play chess, checkers, and even more inspirations began to unravel, such as football games at MIT during the 1960s. The earliest examples of video games are the Nimrod computer in 1951 at the Festival of Britain, OXO, a tic-tac-toe type of video game created by Alexander S. Douglas for the EdSec in 1952, Tennis for Two by William Hyam Botham in 1958, and written by MIT students Martin Graetz, Steve Russell, and Wade Wittenens on the DEC PDP computer in 1961, and finally Pong in 1972 by Atari. Video games became even more relevant during the late 60s to the 1970s, when Ralph Bayer, known as the father of video games, created something called The Brown Box, a prototype video game that lets players play games such as tennis and other games. In 1968, he patented his interactive television game. Four years later, in 72, Matt Navox releases Odyssey, the first home console based on his designs. On that same year, Nolan Bushnell and Al Alcorn of Atari developed an arcade table tennis game. When they start testing it in Andy Capps Tavern in Sunnydale, California, it starts working. Why? Because so many people played with it so very much, it jammed with quarters. And so, that popular tennis arcade was known as Pong. The very first arcade of its kind before arcade games such as Space Invaders, Galaga, and many more even existed. With Pong, the video game industry evolved from a subculture of computer labs and universities and into the domain of pop culture. Three years later, in 1975, Atari introduces a home version of Pong. Atari's founder, Nolan Bushnell, could not find any partners in the toys business, so he sells the first units through the Sears Roebuck Sporting Goods Department. Although Ralph Bayer was the father of consoles, the very first black game developer, Jerry Lawson, improvised consoles in so many ways. A year after the Pong Arcade's release, the first general computer magazine, Creative Computing, David Al publishes 101 basic computer games allowing gamers to become an ancient Sumerian king in H.M. Robbie, find a creature's hiding in the grid in Mug WMP, 
and Command the North vs. South in Civil W. In 1974, decades before Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, Duke Nukem, GoldenEye, Medal of Honor, Call of Duty, Battlefield, and many more ever existed, Mace Wars is introduced. This is considered the very first FPS game of its kind by taking players into a labyrinth of passages made for wireframe graphics. Two years later, before RPGs like Final Fantasy, Elder Scrolls, Chrono Trigger, and many more existed, a game inspired by Dungeons and Dragons was created. That game was called Adventure, created originally by William Crowther in 1975. Adventure was a text-based pioneering game by Don Woods. The game plunged players into an imaginary world with caves and treasures. The game paved the way for Zork, as well as other RPG games such as Wizardry and a thousand others. In 1976, Jerry Lawson would help create the Fairchild Channel F console, a home entertainment machine created by Fairchild Semiconductor, where Mr. Lawson worked as Director of Engineering and Marketing. His work allowed people to play in a variety of games in their homes and paved the way for consoles such as the Atari, Nintendo, PlayStation, and Xbox. Mr. Lawson is the first black video game developer that is a shining example and icon to African American game developers and gamers everywhere, and proof that many African Americans can succeed in becoming game developers. Don't give up, brothers and sisters, and you shall succeed! In 1977, the year of Star Wars, Atari releases the video computer system, more commonly known as the Atari 2600, featuring a joystick, interchangeable cartridges, games in color, and switches for selecting games and setting difficulty levels, thus making millions of Americans home video game players. Aside from gaming, I must say that the 70s was one heck of a decade because we had various great movies such as American Graffiti, The Godfather 1 and 2, Superman, Star Wars, and Saturday Night Fever, and Jaws as well. The Godfather in Star Wars would have video games as well, and so would Jaws. Superman would have his own video games in the Atari later on, and also on the NES and in later consoles. But not every Superman game was very successful, unfortunately. In 1978, Taito released in Japan one of the biggest arcade hits of all time, Space Invaders. Space Invaders became very popular in the United States of America upon its release, which was jammed with quarters each time players hung out playing that game in arcades, bowling alleys, pizza parlors, and many more. Then, in the final year of the 1970s, toy maker Mattel Supplements is handheld electronic games with a new console, the Intellivision. This console had better graphics and more sophisticated controls than Atari 2600, and players love its sports games. Mattel sold 3 million units. The 1970s was known as the first generation of video games. As for Space Invaders, this game introduced or popularized several important concepts in arcade video games, including play regulated by lives instead of a timer or set score, gaining extra lives through accumulating points, and the tracking of the high score achieved on the machine. It was also the first game to confront the player with waves of targets that would shoot back at the player, and the first to include background music during play, a simple four-note loop. With its intense gameplay and competitive scoring features, Space Invaders became a national phenomenon as over 200,000 Invader games, counting clones and knockoffs, entered Japanese game centers by the middle of 1979. While not as popular er, in the United States, Space Invaders became the biggest hit the industry had seen since the Great Depression as Midway, serving as a North American manufacturer, moved over 60,000 cabinets. The one-two punch of Space Invaders and the Atari game Asteroids, which moved 70,000 units and popularized the recording of multiple high scores in the table, resulted in video arcade games completely displacing pinball and other amusements to become the central attraction of not just the shopping mall arcade, but also a variety of street locations from convenience stores, to bowling alleys, to pizza parlors, etc. Many of the best-selling games of 1980 and 1981, such as Galaxian, Arcade Defender, Missile Command, Tempest, and Galaga, focus on shooting mechanics and achieving high scores as well. 
the 1980s was a very special time to many people with all these awesome movies, Star Wars included, sitcoms, TV shows, the music videos killing the radio star, and especially the cartoons. However, the early 80s would birth the second generation of video games. Video games would evolve to a whole new level as there would be competitions and tournaments during the summer and some other seasons as well. In 1980, a missing slice of pizza inspires Namco's Toru Iwatani to create a game called Pac-Man, which went on sale on July of that same year. On that same year, the game was released on Atari 2600. Pac-Man was such a great game that men and women enjoyed. In 1999, Billy Mitchell became the first person to achieve a perfect score of Pac-Man. The character that gives his name to the game is a small yellow pipe-like figure with a missing wedge for its mouth. Players direct Pac-Man through a series of mazes while avoiding four ghosts, Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. In order to continue onto the next level, the player must clear the maze of his 240 dots and four energizer pedals. If Pac-Man is caught by a ghost, he disappears into a yellow light and a life is lost. Eating an Energizer pill gives Pac-Man a temporary ability to eat the ghost for 1,600 bonus points each. Fruits and other random objects appear throughout the mazes to be eaten for extra points. With Pac-Man, the focus of the video game industry shifted from space shooting games to maze chase games. Arcades flourished and arcades games appeared in an array of businesses. Pac-Man acted as a mascot of the video game revolution. His success introduced a new type of lovable video game characters. Mario, Sonic, and Pikachu would succeed him. Like Pong, clones of Pac-Man were plentiful, but none were as popular as the original. Two years later, a spin-off known as Ms. Pac-Man was created, striking a blow for gender equality by becoming the best-selling arcade game of all time. According to trade publication Vending Times, revenues generated by coin-operated video games on location in the USA jumped from $308 million in 1978 to 968 million in the following year to 2.8 billion in 1980. As Pac-Man ignited an even larger video game craze and attracted more female players to arcades, revenues jumped again to 4.9 billion in 1981. According to trade publication Play Meter, by July of 1982, total coin op collections peaked at 8.9 billion dollars, of which 7.7 .7 billion came from video games. Meanwhile, the number of arcades defined as any location with 10 or more games more than doubled between July of 1981 and July of 1983, from over 10,000 to just over 25,000. These figures made arcade games the most popular entertainment medium in the country, far surpassing both pop music at $4 billion in sales per year and Hollywood films $3 billion. In the following year after Pac-Man's success, Nintendo introduced its most popular mascot that still reigns as such up until today. And that mascot is none other than Mario. Many video game fans went crazy over Donkey Kong, featuring a character called Jumpman. Jumpman was Mario's original name at the time. Shigeru Miyamoto would later make him the star of Nintendo by making a game series which he would have various adventures in the Mushroom Kingdom fighting against Bowser and his minion alongside his brother Luigi and saving Princess Peach. Mario would not only have adventure games, but also sports games such as kart racing, tennis, baseball, soccer, golf, and so on. The early 80s, however, would not be such a great time for video games. In 1983, the video game industry went on a severe economic recession in both Japan and North America that occurred from 1983 to 1985. This event was known as the Video Game Crash of 1983. The Crash of 83, also known as the Atari Shock in Japan, was a massive economic recession of the video gaming industry that occurred from 1983 to 1985. This crash was a very serious and hard time for the then booming industry that it ended the second generation of video games. This hard time put a lot of companies on bankruptcy that produced home computers and video game consoles in the region including the fastest growing U.S. company in the history at that point, Atari. There were various reasons for the crash, but the main cause, however, was the saturation of the market. 
The full effects of the gaming industry would not be felt until two years later. If it wasn't for the success of the Nintendo Entertainment System, then we would not have all these awesome video games that we all loved and still do up until this day. There were various factors of the crash such as the flooded console market. At the time of the North American crash, there were many consoles on the market, including the Atari 2600, Atari 5200, ColecoVision, Odyssey 2, and Fairchild 2. In addition to this, Mattel and Coleco created devices that allowed them to play 2600 games on their consoles, and the creation of Atari 2600 in television clones, such as the Coleco Gemini and the Sears Telegame systems, Tandy Vision, etc. Each of these consoles had its own library of games produced by the console maker, and many had large libraries of games produced by third party developers. In 1982, Analysts noticed trends of saturation, mentioning that the amount of new software coming in will only allow a few big hits, that retailers had too much floor space for systems. Along with price drops for home computers could result in an industry shakeup. The release of so many new games in 1982 flooded the market. Most stores had insufficient space to carry new games and consoles. As stores tried to return the surplus games to new publishers, the publishers had neither new products nor cash to issue refunds to the retailers. Many publishers, gamed by Apollo and US Games, quickly folded. Unable to return the unsold games to the front publishers, stores marked down the titles and placed them in discount bins and sale tables. Recently released games which initially sold for $35 were in bins for $5. By June of 1983, the market for the more expensive games had shrunk dramatically and was replaced by a market of rush-to-market, low-budget games. A massive industry shakeout resulted. Magnavox abandoned the video game business entirely. Imagic withdrew its IPO the day before its stock was to go public. The company later collapsed. As a result, while some stores sold new games and machines, most retailers stopped selling video game consoles or reduced their stock significantly reserving floor or shelf space for other products. This was the most formidable barrier that confronted Nintendo as it tried to market its Famicom system in the United States. Retailer opposition to video games was directly responsible for causing Nintendo to brand its product an entertainment system rather than a console, using terms such as control deck and game pack, as well as producing a toy robot called ROB to convince toy retailers to allow it in their stores. The sales of home video games had dropped considerably during this period, from $3 billion in 1982 to as low as $100 million in 1985, despite Atari's claim of 1 million sales of its 2600 game system during that year, recovery was very slow. Following the release of the NES, Atari 7800, and Sega Master System in 1986, the industry began recovering with annual sales exceeding $2.3 billion by 1988, with 70% of the market dominated by Nintendo. In 1986, the Nintendo president at that time, the late Hiroshi Yamauchi, noted that Atari collapsed because they gave too much freedom to third-party developers and the market was swamped with rubbish games. In response, Nintendo limited the number of titles that third-party developers could release for their system each year and promoted its seal of quality, which it allowed to be used on games and peripherals by publishers that met Nintendo's quality standards. The end of the crash allowed Commodore to raise the price of the C64 for the first time upon the June 1986 introduction of the Commodore 64. C, a Commodore 64 redesigned for lower cost of manufacture, which Compute cited as the end of the home computer price war, one of the primary causes of the crash. The crash had long-term effects, however, such as dominance in the home console market was shifted from the USA to Japan. By 1986, three years after its introduction, 6.5 million Japanese homes, 19% of the population, owned a family computer and the company began exporting it to the US. The family computer in the USA was known as the Nintendo Entertainment System, which was by far the most dominant home console by the late 1980s. A second highly visible result of the crash was the institution of measures to control third-party development of software, using secrecy to combat industrial espionage, and had failed to stop rival companies from reverse engineering the Mattel and Atari systems, and hiring away 
their trained game programmers. While Mattel and Coleco implemented lockout measures to control third-party development, the Atari 2600 was completely unprotected and once information on its hardware became available, little prevented anyone from making games for it. Nintendo thus instituted a strict licensing policy for the NES that included equipping the cartridge and console with lockout chips, which were region-specific and had to match in order to, for a game to work. In addition to preventing the use of unlicensed games, it was also designed to combat piracy, rarely a problem in the United States or Europe, but rampant in East Asia. Nintendo reserved a large part of NES game revenue for itself by limiting most third-party publishers to only five games per year on its systems. It also required all cartridges to be manufactured by Nintendo and to be paid for in full before they were manufactured. Cartridges could not be returned to Nintendo, so publishers assumed all the risk. As a result, some publishers lost more money due to the stress sales of remaining inventory at the end of the NES era than they ever earned profits from sales of the games. Nintendo portrayed these measures as intended to protect the public against poor quality games and place a golden seal of approval on all licensed games released for the system. These strict licensing measures backfired somewhat after Nintendo was accused of trust behavior. In the longer run, however, many third-party publishers such as Electronic Arts actively supported competing consoles such as the Sega Genesis. Most of the Nintendo platform control measures were adopted by later console manufacturers such as Sega, Sony, and Microsoft, although not as stringently. The rise of Nintendo and Sega to the home console market put an end to the economic recession of the gaming industry in the 1980s. Very popular games of the NES and Sega Genesis are Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, Metroid, Mega Man, Metal Gear, Castlevania, Megami Tensei, Alex Kidd in Miracle World, Fantasy Star, Ninja Gaiden, and Bomberman. So what exactly is a bid? A bid is a single binary digit, a 1 or a 0. There are two different places in computing where bits get counted, in color displays and in processing. Each pixel on your screen is assigned a number, which is translated into a color for display. The number of bits tells you how many colors can simultaneously be displayed on the screen. For example, 8-bit color means that you can only have a maximum of 256 colors on your display. Modern systems use 24-bit color, 8 bits each for red, blue, and green intensities, for a total of 16.78 million colors. In computer processing, numbers are handled not in individual bits, but in bundles of 8 called bytes. The most common processor out there stores numerical values in blocks of 4 bytes each. For integers, that means values from 0 to about 4 billion or the range minus 2 billion to plus 2 billion. More recent and more powerful processors store and manipulate numbers in blocks of 8 bytes each or 64 bits. The 8-bit or third generation started when the video game crash of 1983 ended in a time where video games suffered an economic recession as explained earlier. When Nintendo found success in Donkey Kong, the company wanted into the console business. Unfortunately, at that time, it could not do to backlash against video games. This led them to disguise the console as a toy using the peripheral called the Famicom Robot, also known as Rob. Although not well received, it was something that led to the creation of the family computer in Japan, and in America, that's where the NES arrived. Once that was done, they released Super Mario Bros. 1, re-establishing video games as an acceptable form of entertainment. Soon afterward, a few other companies entered the video game console market with its newfound prominence like Sega with the Sega Master System and Atari with the 7800, though none achieved the worldwide prominence of the NES. This era introduced a revolutionary aspect of video game design, the scroll. Throughout the golden age of video games, Games either only had a single screen or flip screen gameplay, which created respectively a constraint in the size of a level and disruption in the flow of the game. 
Scrolling graphics was a big leap in game design in that levels could not be much longer and flow a lot better than in the Golden Age. Also compared to the Golden Age, sprites started to actually look like real objects, or at least cartoon objects. More colorful sprites were much more prevalent than the usually monochrome sprites in older games. Also, the backgrounds got much more colorful, whereas Golden Age games would usually have black backgrounds with little to no detail. Near the end of the 8-bit era, instead of most of the plot being described in the manual, games began adding explaining the plot in the game. They already did this somewhat at the beginning, but it was often just a simple dialogue. Then you were off on your adventure. Basic narrative devices such as chase scenes and different endings were starting to take root in the industry. However, because of the limited hardware at the time, full cinematics couldn't be taken advantage of just yet. Many of the most commercially successful video game franchises of all time debuted as part of this era with recognizable names like Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy, Mega Man, and Castlevania among them. After the success of the 8-bit era, the fourth generation of video games began in 1987 with the release of the NEC's TurboGrafx-16. With this new era came hardware more powerful than their 8-bit counterparts, capable of handling more colorful and detailed graphics, as well as more complex types of games. However, the era of 16-bits gained momentum with the release of the Sega Mega Drive, also known as the Genesis. This console was released to compete with the Nintendo's 8-bits and the console turned out to be a huge success with games such as Altered Beast. But the Sega Genesis really took off with games such as Sonic the Hedgehog, which was a major success. And so, that lovable blue hedgehog became Sega's official mascot. Much like Mario, Sonic was not only in video games, but it also spawned color books, toys, comics, cartoons such as The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic Underground, and Sonic Boom. Sonic also spawned an animated movie as well, as an anime series titled Sonic X. And earlier this year, a live-action movie, which was a major success, Sonic Mania, lives on. With the Genesis being more successful than the NES, this prompted Nintendo to create the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. This fierce console war between both the Sega and the Super NES defined the era and both parties were in a huge race for dominance over the industry. The most successful games of the 16-bit era are many of them, not just in Sega Genesis but also on the Super NES. Examples of these successful games are The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, Echo the Dolphin, Yoshi's Island, Super Mario World, and many more. The releases of Mortal Kombat 1 and Donkey Kong Country sparked a craze in digitized sprites on consoles, with notable games following suit, including Vector Man and Super Mario RPG. The era also produced early experiments with political graphics on home consoles, most notably Star Fox, but also including arcade ports. Another genre that was born, and even more revolutionized in this era, was the fighting genre. And the most popular titles of the 16-bit era in fighting games are... Street Fighter 2, Mortal Kombat, and Killer Instinct. The video game Mortal Kombat, however, was very controversial due to blood violence, which shocked and concerned many parents, activists, religious groups, and causing the government to threaten the industry. This led to the birth of the ESRB in 1994, and much like the Motion Picture Association of America would include ratings in video games. Games Rated E stands for everyone, and it was originally called Kids to Adults. Early childhood is about video games where children ages 3 and up can play, and there is nothing that can disturb parents in the reading of these games, because they're mostly aimed at kindergartners. Everyone 10 and up was introduced in 2005. It may contain some violence, language, crude humor, but not with the same extent as the teen rating. T stands for teen, which are video games for teenagers 13 and up. These games contain some mild violence, mild language, suggestive themes, and mild lyrics depending on the song. M stands for Mature, for people 17 and up. Games of this rating have strong violence, gore, sexual content, strong languages, and partial nudity. 
Adults Only is a rating that is not suitable for people under 18. Much like the M rating, this one has a much more intense level of violence, sexual content, languages, nudity, and drug use. In the fourth generation, JRPGs were becoming even more popular in 16 bits. Examples are Final Fantasy IV, Final Fantasy V, and Final Fantasy VI, Colonel Traeger, Breath of Fire, Illusion of Gaia, Fantasy Star II, Super Mario RPG, and many more. The successes of these RPGs would later become a major part in the evolution of consoles and graphics. Also in this generation, portable gaming systems began to gain traction with the release of the Nintendo Game Boy and Atari Lynx in 1989, and the Sega Game Gear in 1990. While the Lynx failed to gain much success, Nintendo and Sega's efforts gave gamers versions of their favorite franchises to take with them when they were away from their televisions. While Sega's system certainly benefited from its colored screen, it was ultimately the Game Boy that would win out by a considerable margin, boosted by the inclusion of Tetris as a pack-in game making the system more appealing to those who weren't already interested in video games than Super Mario Land might. Though the fact that it was significantly cheaper, more pocketable, and had much better battery life also helped. Its success will continue into the next generation. One might say this generation ended when the Super NES was officially discontinued 20 years ago, but the Mega Drive officially discontinued in 1998 has had an active afterlife. Licensed games by third-party developers have been sporadically released into the new tens, and licensed Mega Drive units with built-in games are still being sold today. The video games arrived sometime in 1993 and lasted until 2001. In this era, 16 bits would evolve into 32 bit and then to 64 bits. However, this era ushered in the arrival of 3D rendered graphics in video games, a great leap in terms of graphics, visuals, music, storytelling, design, and also the way video games were being played and viewed. The first Star Fox video game for the Super NES was one of many first attempts to bring 3D polygons to consoles and achieve massive popularity. But when the fighting revolutionary game Virtual Fighter was released in the arcades, polygons really took off. This edition made 8 and 16-bit graphic games look outdated and a thing of the past, and it was said that 3D rendered polygons were the future of video games. Nintendo and its new rival at the time, Sony, were starting to create consoles that can support 3D rendering. These consoles were the Nintendo 64 and the Sony PlayStation. Sega, however, took a while to develop a console that can support 3D graphics. Thus, the Sega Saturn was born. Many gamers who grew up with 8-bit and 16-bit were wowed at the look of 3D rendered graphics showing more explored worlds in 3D, which had superior depths than 2D graphics at the time. A lot of the developers worked their heart and time into making the worlds more beautiful and detailed. Great examples of games in 3D at the time are Super Mario 64, Final Fantasy 7, Resident Evil, Metal Gear Solid, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Star Wars Shadows of the Empire, Star Fox 64, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, Chrono Cross, and many more. While Nintendo 64 was still in cartridges, the rest of the other consoles went into CD-ROM because it was an ideal format for game developers at the time. It was really cheap to produce and had higher capacities than cartridges. An example is Final Fantasy VII, which was originally headed for the Nintendo 64, but due to the lower capacity of the cartridge and the length of the game's storyline and side quests, Final Fantasy VII went to the PlayStation and so did its successors from then on. While PlayStation and Sega Saturn had CD-ROM formats, Nintendo refused to have one. Why? Because with this earliest experiment, the Famicom Disk System, these CD-ROMs were a target of piracy, and since then, Nintendo was very, very strict with its games and prevention of piracy. Despite not having CD-ROM format due to lack of third-party associates, the Nintendo 64 is remembered by having an analog stick because most of its 3D games had no capacity to use the D-pad. Years later, PlayStation surpassed the N64 by introducing the DualShock controller. 
The cool thing about the N64 controller was the rumble feature with a special pack known as the Rumble Pack. Many games with rumble features were Star Fox, GoldenEye, and many more. In the late 1990s, Sega would introduce the Dreamcast, which was far more successful than the Saturn and Sega CD. Many gamers were wowed to see Sonic the Hedgehog rendered in 3D and the rich atmosphere of the hit video game, Sonic Adventure. As for the portables, Nintendo introduced in the late 90s a new version of the Game Boy called Game Boy Color, which games rather than black and white or greenish appearances, it was much more colorful and detailed, which was really good. The game that was extremely popular rivaling Mario for the Game Boy Color was none other than Pokemon Red and Blue. In 1999, Pokemon Yellow Special Pikachu Edition was released and then Gold, Silver, and Crystal in the early 2000s. SNK's Neo Geo Pocket and Bandai's Wander Swan would only find small audiences in the markets they reach and do little to dent the fortunes of the monochrome machine. This generation is what gave the biggest forward leap in video gaming history in both graphics and stories, from sprites to polygons. A lot of people who grew up with the third and fourth and fifth generation of video games believed it time to be a new golden age for video games. Nintendo, Sony, and Sega were really at their best when they introduced 3D. Many games rendered in 3D such as Final Fantasy VII, Super Mario 64, Metal Gear Solid, Sonic Adventure, Resident Evil were popular, and even good old Castlevania jumped into 3D with Castlevania 64 and Legacy of Darkness, and later games like Lament of Innocence and Curse of Darkness. Online gaming already was prevalent in PCs with games such as EverQuest, StarCraft, and many more before World of Warcraft, Counter-Strike, Fortnite, Apex Legends, and League of Legends ever existed. But how did online gaming arrive to home consoles? It all began with the 6th generation or the 128-bit era of video games, which started in 1998 to 2008. This era began in November 27, 1998, with the release of the Sega's final console, the Dreamcast. Consoles of this generation include the PlayStation 2, Nintendo GameCube, and the Microsoft Xbox. The Dreamcast, however, was the first console of its kind to have online features, with online play and downloadable games, as well as reviving the Sonic the Hedgehog series that was strangely on hiatus during the fifth generation. However, Sony, fresh off a of victory in last generation's console wars, was gearing up to release the PlayStation 2. The hype surrounding this console, as well as many dubious or bad decisions on Sega's part in previous generations, leaving them with a shaky public opinion, led to insufficient sales to keep Sega afloat, leading to the quick end of the Dreamcast in early 2001, and a former console maker going third party. In the Dreamcast, however, people will play online with games such as NBA 2K, 2K1, Fantasy Star Online, etc. Before the Dreamcast was released, however, there were early attempts to bring gaming consoles online such as the Satella View for the Super Famicom and the Nintendo 64 DD. In the year 2000, the PlayStation 2 was released and achieved massive popularity and it was the second video game console to feature online gaming features. But what was required to play online on the PS2 was the network adapter. All versions of the network adapter provide an Ethernet port, while some North American versions also feature a phone line port for dial-up connection. The newer slimline versions, however, have an Ethernet port built into them, making the network adapter unnecessary and hard drive use nearly impossible, as well as ruling out any need to keep the network adapter in production. Playing online games requires you that users set up the system's network connection configuration, which is saved to a memory card. This can be done with a network startup disk that came with a network adapter or using one of the many games that had the utility built into them, such as Resident Evil Outbreak, to set up the network settings. The new slimline PlayStation 2 came with a 
disk in the box by default. The last version of the disk was Network Startup Disk 5.0, which was included with a newer SCPH-90004 model released in 2009. However, as of December 31st, 2012, the PlayStation 2 has been discontinued, and the servers for games have all since been shut down. PlayStation 2 had various online games such as Resident Evil Outbreak, Final Fantasy XI, SOCOM US Navy SEALs, the classic Star Wars Battlefront, Time Splitters 2, and many more. Although some of these mentioned games are still playable offline, as for Final Fantasy XI, the online servers were shut down in 2016, officially ending the saga of the PlayStation 2. Many gamers of previous generations would agree that PlayStation 2 was the best of its time. Others would beg to differ. After the declining of the Dreamcast, Microsoft introduced its first console, the Xbox, which, like the PS2, achieved massive popularity with many great games with online features, such as Halo Combat Evolved, which met with great success, leaving a great legacy behind, even surpassing Metroid. Most would choose Halo over Metroid. Both fans of Halo and Metroid remember that incredibly famous fight film called Haloid. It was Samus against Master Chief, but that Chief was not exactly the one we all know. It was created by Monty Alm. May he rest in peace. The Dreamcast, PS2, GameCube, and Xbox consoles are very well remembered as well for their more advanced graphics, popular games, online features, and many more. In this generation, the Nintendo GameCube was the first Nintendo console to have CD-ROM, and it also had such features with an online adapter. But in terms of online gameplay, it was not as popular as the PS2 and Xbox. However, the CD-ROMs of the GameCube were smaller, like mini-DVDs one might say. Although, the controller was praised, it was still criticized for exterior design and lack of features. Nintendo also had the intention of entering the online space with the GameCube, using a broadband and modem adapter for this purpose instead of built-in features. Unfortunately, it was discovered rather quickly that the cable could be used to hack into the GameCube, leading to piracy. Nintendo, having a long-standing fear of piracy, responded by sweeping the adapter into obscurity and releasing an updated re-release of Fantasy Star Online in order to make hacking impossible. Thus, the GameCube was rendered as the only console of the generation without online features. In this generation, children were not the only demographics in video games. Teenagers and young adults were increasing in numbers and later became the majority in demographics in video games. This era also brought darker and edgier games since the 16-bit era of video games. Dark and violent video games like God of War, Resident Evil 4, and Grand Theft Auto redefined the medium as primarily for the older crowd rather than kids. Nintendo's reputation for being the uncool kids gaming company put them in a bad position because of these trends, which wasn't helped by the GameCube's toy-like appearance. Sony and Microsoft, on the other hand, developed a more core reputation because of the many darker games released on their consoles. There was no genre that defined this era, in fact. Most of them from action, action-adventure, first-person shooter, third-person shooter, RPG, platformer, and sports, and even several that didn't fit any established genre, saw equal measure of success. This led to the sixth generation being the most diverse era in terms of game variety. Lastly, on the handheld front, Nintendo's Game Boy Advance dominated the market, being essentially a portable Super Nintendo. When compared to the non-portable consoles of the era, it lacked only behind the PlayStation 2 in terms of sales. It would be Nintendo's last 2D system, and the last of the Game Boys, as it will be replaced by the Nintendo DS. Many people praise online gaming due to interacting with various gamers, which resulted in friendships, relationships, meeting in person to start a close friendship or romantic relationship, which resulted in marriage proposals, and starting a family. However, online gaming has its cons as well, such as bullying incidents, death threats, name calling, sexism, and toxic attitudes from various other gamers. 
Some situations occurred where gamers went after other gamers for a fight, or even worse than that. The seventh generation of video games was a time where video games were revolutionized in new eras and the evolution of old elements. The seventh generation introduced new consoles with HD resolutions as well as the evolution of handhelds. For handhelds, Sony had its very first one known as the PlayStation Portable, PSP for short, and it also had the capacity to play online. As for Nintendo, it introduced the Nintendo DS, which became very, very popular. Three new consoles were very popular in this era, and the console wars were growing intensely. These three were the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, and the Nintendo Wii. The seventh generation of video games began in November 22nd of 2005. The first major console launch in this generation was Microsoft's Xbox 360. While it wasn't the first console with the ability to output an HD resolution note, it was the first to implement it as a standard for games. It eschewed the PC-based architecture of its predecessor, but used development tools very similar to those for PC games, making it easy to develop for. Unfortunately, the early launch was plagued with hardware issues, most infamously, the Red Ring of Death. The next year, Sony's PlayStation 3 saw a release. The PlayStation 3 was marketed as a household supercomputer, as it was manufactured with cutting-edge technology like the cell processor and the very high-capacity Blu-ray format. The latter was actually put in as a push for the Blu-ray format, since there was still a competition as to what the standard high-capacity optical disc would be. However, said cutting-edge technology came with a hefty cost, as the console was released with an infamously high price of $600, and many studios found the hardware very difficult and expensive to make games for. Despite early launch issues, both HD consoles did drum up excitement for what could be done on these powerful machines. As for Nintendo, because it fell behind the PS2 and the Xbox due to the lack of features of the GameCube, many feared that it would leave the console business and go third party just like Sega, Atari, and Hudson Soft did before. But of course, it wasn't over for Nintendo. They still had a few tricks up their sleeve by introducing the Nintendo DS. The Nintendo DS was very popular with games such as Super Mario 64 DS, New Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda Fountain Hourglass, Spirit Tracks, Final Fantasy 3 and 4, and many more. Nintendo DS was like the N64 of Nintendo handhelds after the Game Boy Advance, which was considered more of a handheld Super NES going into 16-bit graphics. Popular games for the 360 were Gears of War, Halo 3, Halo Wars, Forza Motorsport, Dead Rising, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Lost Odyssey, Borderlands 2, and many more. For the PS3, the most popular games were the Uncharted Trilogy, Killzone 2, Killzone 3, Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots, Red Dead Redemption, The Last of Us, God of War 3, Heavy Rain, and many more. As for the Nintendo Wii, the most popular ones were The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword, Super Mario Galaxy, Mario Kart Wii, Super Smash Bros. Brawl, Metro Prime 3 Corruption, Xenoblade Chronicles, and the list goes on and on. Aside from popular games, the Nintendo Wii was very successful in the beginning. The console was first released on November 19, 2006. The Nintendo Wii was well known for four things. One, being innovative. Two, for being the kiddie console company. Third, for making their products durable. And fourth, for being dead last in the console wars. Third parties wanted nothing to do with them, and some gamers thought Nintendo would concentrate on handhelds and, or even go third party like Sega, Hudson Soft, Atari, and SNK. In the escalating cost of the superior graphics in the console wars between Sony and Microsoft, it was thought that Nintendo couldn't compete. In response, they created an innovative, durable, family-friendly console. This time, though, they would not be dead last. 
The Wii had the virtual console in which many games from previous consoles will be purchased and downloaded not only from Nintendo, but also from Sega, SNK, TurboGrafx-16, and also from different brands. The Wii also had the WiiWare which originally made games would be downloadable for purchase. Examples are Castlevania Adventure Rebirth and Final Fantasy IV The After Years. This console was also known for its unique type of controller known as a Wii mode, which resembled a TV remote, and it was also known for its nunchuck style type of controller which had a joystick. By day one, it sold millions of copies, making it one of the most successful consoles in the seventh generation of video games. Another cool thing about the Wii was the capacity to connect GameCube controllers and memory cards and also play GameCube games. The Wii, however, was the most family-friendly type of console than the other two, the PS3 and Xbox 360. Sony in this generation introduced its very first handheld system, the PlayStation Portable, also known as a PSP. The PSP also had the capacity to play online, as explained earlier. Much like the PS3, there was an app known as the PlayStation Store that was accessible online and an account was required to gain access to it. On the PlayStation Store, you could purchase and download games from past systems and the current ones as well. Not to forget that the PSP was like a mini DVD or Blu-ray player where you could watch some of your favorite movies and TV shows. You could also download movies and TV shows from the PlayStation Store and still do it up until this day. Later, the three consoles will also have the capacity to download the movie TV show viewing app, Netflix. Not to forget, they will also have the capacity to download Hulu and Crunchyroll. As for the PS3 and Xbox 360 successors, the PS4 and Xbox One, they will also have Amazon Prime, HBO Max, Disney Plus, and so on. As for the PlayStation Network, there was an original reality series and game show that lasted only three seasons. That show was called The Tester. The Tester was hosted by model and gamer Meredith Molinari, and the judges were quality assurance manager for SCEA, Brent Goki. In season one, special guest judge was standard comedian and gamer Hal Sparks, who was later replaced by the winner of season one of America's Next Top Model, Adrian Curry Rhodes. The show was about 11 or 12 gamers that were selected from thousands of applicants. These men and women will compete in a series of challenges to prove that they have what it takes to become a PlayStation game tester, but there was only one winner, and the rest of the competitors had to go through heartbreaking eliminations. The PlayStation Network also had a short-lived series that lasted for two seasons, Powers, which was based on the comic book of the same name. Some would say it was a combination of Heroes and Law and & Order. The success of both PSP and DS created a turning point for the Japanese console market, and for that, they started focusing on more on handhelds rather than consoles in a certain way. Casual and indie games were also having their share of success as well by adding games to mobile devices, and mobile devices were growing in power as well. Many popular games in this generation are games such as Halo 3, Halo 4, Modern Warfare, Black Ops, Skyward Sword, Dead Space, Assassin's Creed, and many more. Another very popular game at the end of this generation is The Last of Us for the PS3, which was later remastered for the PS4, and contained its standalone DLC storyline, Left Behind. To conclude with this generation, episodic games began to rise. Known examples of episodic games are Telltale's The Walking Dead, Telltale's Game of Thrones, The Wolf Among Us, Life is Strange, and many more. For every positive, there is a negative. Another phenomenon was when video games were becoming family game night events, much like card game night events, Super Bowl gatherings, and as family game nights were for earlier generations. This proved to be a turning point and gaming was an acceptable form of entertainment. One scene as to like novelties or murder simulators were finally gaining mainstream acceptance. Video games, though loved by many, were still being portrayed in a negative light by the media, politicians, Instead and activists. Why they are portrayed in such ways? Well, because they think that video games are evil and teach people how to kill people and be criminals. 
Countless of times this has been debunked by many bloggers, game developers, and many more. Video games have always been blamed for random acts of violence such as the shootings of Columbine, Aurora, Newtown, San Bernardino, Pulse, Parkland, Jacksonville, and many more. The most well-known enemy of video games is Jack Thompson, known for his crusade against violent video games like Duke Nukem, Doom, and most especially, the Grand Theft Auto series of video games. Hillary Clinton, then a senator at the time, would go after Grand Theft Auto and other games as well. Whenever incidental situations like mass shootings at a school, a mall, a house of faith, and nightclubs, video games would often be the scapegoat of so many of these tragic situations. Other well-known anti-gaming people were Senator Jay Rockefeller, Leyland Yi, Ralph Nader, Diane Feinstein, Pastor Matthew Hagee, Pat Robertson, and even the Trump administration would attack video games as well. Unfortunately, violence is part of human nature. To say that video games are responsible for violence and sexism, it's like if you're saying that David killed Goliath by throwing a PS3 at his head, and like if Genghis Khan was inspired by Assassin's Creed. Regarding sexism, it's like saying that the church was inspired to hunt and brand innocent women as witches by playing Castlevania. It's like saying how Marianne Cotton was inspired by Grand Theft Auto to kill her multiple husbands and children. It's also like saying that Hitler was playing Call of Duty and decided to kill anyone he hated and labeled as undesirables, such as Jews, homosexuals, gypsies, blacks, and so on. People think that video games are sexist because of men saving women, women showing a lot of skin, seductresses, and sandbox style games like Grand Theft Auto, Saints Row, where you attack people of both genders equally. In games like the Grand Theft Auto and Saints Row series of games, everyone is a target regardless of what they look like. Some would accuse games of racism due to characters like Evil Ryu and Violent Ken when they turn evil oh, and their skin turns brown. This is not intended to be racist. According to Street Fighter lore, the Satsui no Hado's influence on someone can make a person's eyes glow red and their teeth will extend into sharp fangs as the body of their skin darkens over time. Their hair will also turn red to white and their nails will turn into claws. Black color doesn't represent evil, but a darkness that we cannot see and where evil might be lurking. Street Fighter 2 was accused of such things because of the arcade intro back in 1992. This is because America was slowly getting over the Los Angeles riots at the time. But the intro was not included in the Super NES version and the Sega Genesis version changed the color of the character that was punched. Various religious groups would say that video games had hidden messages of evil. They believed Doom was a devil worship video game due to imageries of Satanism. They went after Pokemon because they believed it was demonic, especially since they evolved. And as you know, most believers of the gospel do not believe in the theory of evolution. And because they believe that people are born because of Adam and Eve, while others like Richard Dawkins might state that we come from a common ancestor and evolved from such ancestor. We gamers have survived a lot of these logical fallacies despite some censorship in gaming in these times. We have survived the media, politicians, religious groups, and many more. Even though they still say that games have taught sexism, violence, and devil worship, Time and again, it has been debunked, and scientific studies have shown that they do not cause such things. Violence and sexism existed long before the invention of Pong. Violence and sexism are not caused by video games. They are caused due to bullying, ostracism, abuse of power, the need to control, self-entitlement, superiority complex, victim mentality, radicalization, and hatred because of being female or male, and also because of their sexual orientation, their religious beliefs, their non-religious beliefs, and also racial bigotry is the cause of such things as well. Most games recreate and emulate real life, and such things are coded because they existed, do exist, and will exist for the foreseeable future. 
Video games can also have other cons, such as addiction, which can become a problem. There are stories of online gaming addiction, such as a man playing EverQuest. For hours, of course. He skipped work and paid no attention to domestic duties, causing his wife to leave him, getting fired, and messed up his whole life because of that. Even addiction to games like Warcraft and Fortnite can become a problem. For example, a young girl was shut into rehab due to addiction to Fortnite. Now, as much as I love gaming, I must advise all of my fellow gamers this. We all love to play video games and escape from all these harsh realities like school, college, work, pay the bills, buy the food, and keep a roof above our heads. But there has to be a time to get out of our comfort zone. Because if we are stuck in one world, how can we progress as people? How can we achieve our dreams? Yes, gaming can be a way of life, but sometimes you gotta get out of the comfort zone and do more important duties. In 2012, three new consoles were announced at E3. These consoles were the Xbox One, the PlayStation 4, and the Nintendo Wii U. There were also micro consoles appearing in this generation, such as the Ouya, which allowed players to play classic games of previous generations, such as Donkey Kong Country. And also newer handhelds had risen, such as the Nintendo 3DS and the PS Vita. Both handhelds had great games, but the 3DS was the top winner. The Nintendo 3DS also had access to the internet using Wi-Fi and also the Virtual Console where you could play old games from the NES, Super NES, and even the Game Boy Advance. The Nintendo Wii U was released in Thanksgiving on 2012 and was much bigger hardware than the Wii and far more successful. The online capacity of the Wii U was much more improved than that of the Nintendo Wii. On February 2013, Sony unveiled the PlayStation 4. Learning from the mistakes with the PS3's notoriously difficult architecture, they made the console much easier to develop for. Its controller also added in a touchpad to match Nintendo's gamepad touchscreen, along with several other features such as sharing a photo of your gameplay or a video footage of it. So you can upload to YouTube or Twitch and broadcast the gaming as well. On May 21st of 2013, Microsoft unveiled their entry, the Xbox One, thus setting off the flag that officially signals the start of the 8th generation console wars. Valve Software has also presented their intentions to enter the console market with Steam machines, but enthusiasts are still divided over whether it's a console or a small PC, and whether it's part of the 8th generation of consoles. This generation has also seen the rise of micro consoles, starting in earnest with the Ouya which was a Kickstarter-backed Android-based game console. Despite it being one of the biggest projects ever backed, it never found a accessible niche and closed down operations in June 2015 when it was purchased by Razer. In its wake, however, more and more streaming boxes like the Amazon Fire TV, for example, can play some Android games, and newer Android-based boxes, more geared for gaming like Razer's Forge TV, and the NVIDIA Shield can not only play games installed locally, but can also stream games hosted on a network PC or play games stored in an online cloud. While the hardware specs of these micro consoles and streaming boxes obviously pale to the high-end PC-like specs of the PS4 and Xbox One, within a capable ecosystem and adequate bandwidth, they have the possibility of providing an on-par experience as those consoles at a lesser cost. Another successful platform in this generation is a Nintendo Switch. The Switch is playable in two ways, on your television set or on a tablet-like screen using the Joy-Con controllers. This generation is the one where constant manufacturers have embraced the development of indie video games. Not to forget that other devices such as the Oculus Rift and VR Tech are still popular yet controversial. And in this ninth generation, we have the PlayStation 5, and Xbox Series X as well. Video games will continue to evolve and bring new franchises to light, as well as the old ones will continue to shine in all the years to come. And finally in conclusion, video games, in my honest opinion, are a great form of entertainment, an escape for reality, and a great form of art. 
Despite the negative things said about video games, they will never stop being known as a hobby and a way of life that brings all people together regardless of race, gender, religion, non-religious, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. Because video games are for everybody. To some, gaming is just a hobby. To others, gaming is a waste of time. But to so many, gaming is a way of life. I am John of Video Games in the World. Have a good one, gamers. And take care.